Hello, Sabina Brennan here, host of Super Brain, the podcast for everyone with a brain. It takes just 30 seconds on Google or Apple Pay to make a one off donation to support this show. Simply follow the support this show link in the show or episode description. Cheers. Hello and welcome to Superbrain, the podcast for everyone with a brain. My name is Sabina Brennan. I'm a psychologist and neuroscientist, and I am fascinated by people like you, people like me, and people like comedian Joanne McNally. In this episode of Superbrain, I continue my conversation with refreshingly honest Joanne McNally about being adopted, identity, living with not one, but two eating disorders, recovery, and finding and losing herself in comedy. Joanne has a unique ability to talk openly about difficult issues in a humorous and entertaining way that doesn't dilute the seriousness, but shines a spotlight on the issue and I'm sure helps many people in the process. Enjoy the episode. I think all of us, as part of the human condition, is that we, we create stories about why we do things. And sometimes those stories are completely off the wall, but just that's what we have to do we have to explain why we do something so correct me if I'm wrong but in terms of your eating disorder you kind of explained that in some way as uh not wanting to grow up wanting yeah. to stay a child I think so and I you still feel that that was that I think was it be- be- can I ask was it be- both bulimia, bulimia and anorexia, anorexia everything I have a very oh. good work ethic I really went to yeah you went to the whole hog um I think I have uh, whatever I think there's a certain I think my mind is wired a certain way there's always going to be something there's always going to be something there's always going to be something but I think I was when you say now just when you say there's always going to be something something that that just clarify that there's always going to be I know what you mean but I feel like there's always going to be like some addiction issue or I always have to kind of rein myself in for things or there's there was definitely like I'm more settled with myself I felt very estranged from myself I was like I was estranged from myself I wasn't at peace with myself before you had the eating disorder yeah before you had it and when I had it and after and everything I'm only really kind of settling into myself in the last two or three years but you see I think that's like I think that's really interesting because who we are is constantly evolving. True. So to expect yourself to be fully whole and formed yeah. as a child is it, like but it, I was it's in my twenties. Like I just was not at home in myself. So I was always you, you were uncomfortable in your own skin. Yeah. No? I just didn't understand. I just wasn't at peace with myself. So I was always trying to change myself and improve myself. And of course, as a woman, one way to improve yourself is to make yourself thin, 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 thin. And of course, then it became an absolute obsession and yeah I was That's mental <laughs> it's, 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 it, well it's actually quite phenomenal how many people in oh in yeah the, because uh, it's, a uh, really, it's a really it's a really it's a really physically visible way you're told to improve yourself so while your your mind is going up and down and in and out and you don't understand your own thoughts and you're you have imposter syndrome in almost every area of your life your weight is something you can control it's that old thing they always say it's about control it's not actually about your weight really or body dysmorphia which is sort of one of the other theories where you don't see yeah what you actually look well, like I, I, I definitely had a like i remember once seeing a picture of myself and being like whoa I really didn't think I was I still thought I was bigger than everyone else and I saw a picture of myself and it was it was very clear I was unwell yeah and I remember like I I kind of saw I had a moment of clarity for like 30 seconds and was this while you were still in it yeah still still really got kind of going through yeah but at this stage I'd had to leave work and I was starting a treatment program so I was probably I was at my worst really but there was a glimmer of Oh God! Something I look. I look. Said, Whoa! I look weird there. Right. I was like, I look weird there. But then you go, oh, it's a weird angle. It's this, that, and the other. I know that's just because I always lost weight in my face. It's my hips are the problem. Like you, you're the yeah. eating disorder kicks in then again yeah. to make sure it's defending itself. Um, yeah. But I remember when. I, so I wrote a show, bite me about it which was like a comedy theatre. I thought it was stand up, but in hindsight, it absolutely was not. It was comedy theatre, dark right, comedy okay. theatre. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's all based around this one 
I, I kind of took all my therapy sessions and put it into like the epiphanies. I had a couple of ep- like moments of clarity where you okay. have these little epiphanies where you're like, oh, maybe I'm not on a detox and oh, maybe I can't sustain this for the rest of my life. And oh, maybe recovery doesn't just mean getting fat and maybe it would be nice to be able to go for dinner with my friends again, all those kind of things. But I remember... um the big kind of moment for me was uh, when the therapist was like, why do you want to be so thin? Like, right. what is this and obsession? And did you have an answer? I was like, well, at first ones I was like, uh, um, it means I'm successful. Okay. I'm not, every, everywhere tells me that. Like, all the thin people are successful. So that I equated thinness with success. Um, and it makes me more attractive. Okay. And she was like, okay. And she went through them. And at the time... I obviously had to, she, she was like, success in what? And I was like, well, my job. And she's like, and how's your work going at the moment? And I was like, well, obviously I've been let go. <laughs> and I'm back living in my mother's attic. And they're like, oh, in relationships, you say it makes you more attracted to men. How's your love life? And I was like, well, obviously it's in tatters. So it was this moment of all the things that I thought that I was gaining by being Your own thin. story that you had created to justify yeah. your behavior. Were the things I'd already had and my eating disorder had meant that I'd actually lost that them. The, yeah. So that was a real like light bulb moment for me when I was like, oh God, and what am I doing? And was that a light bulb moment to recovery? Yeah. So but somebody was... showing a mirror up to you to kind of say, well, okay, let's test your theory. Exactly. Right. Look where you are. Yeah. Look, look where, look around you. You're in a, you're in a, you're in a psych ward. Yeah. With, and, like, and what are you doing? Come here. Was there... Do you, can you, there's a couple of things jump out to me that are really interesting because I do understand that myself. I would have been as a child, I remember my mother took me to the doctor when I was nine because I had uh, constant headaches and I couldn't ever sleep. Mm. And the doctor actually told my mother that I was trying too hard to please her. Oh my gosh. Yeah, which was kind of really weird. Um, transpires, it's migraine going back the whole way, but but I didn't discover that until kind of a few years ago. Yeah. But um, I definitely would have been, not a people pleaser, but always trying to be, uh, to do what my mother wanted. Yeah. Or, you know, like, to be the good one or the one who got it right. And, and that was, without going into that, that was quite challenging anyway, because you would have had to be inside her head to figure out who she wanted you to be. Mm. Um, and, and I just, something, when, when you said that, that, you know, you, you wanted to be successful, you wanted to be good, you wanted to be, and this was a way you found to do it I've tried to find other ways try to be good at school try to be good at acting try to you know do things that I thought um brought pleasure and I, I I'm just wondering do you think who who was it you were trying to show you were successful or good was it parents was it teachers was it yourself is there was a friend like is can you there's can you de- thinking back was there a trigger or, or no there was no one trigger I I do remember thinking that my purpose was to be considered attractive. Your purpose in life was to be considered attractive. Right. That, oh, that, that was that was the main priority. And nothing else was really as important as that. I I'd very little um so I suppose I'd low self esteem. I, I I suppose most people do. But in Ireland we do. Because you yeah. see you're like I would have been brought up to say, you know, that it's a modest to say anything good about yourself. Yeah, there was a bit I, of that all right. Yeah. And, was, I, and I'm just thinking, actually, so I'm looking, you just said your mum's in her early 70s. Mm. So my eldest son is 30 and I'm only in my 50s. So, you know, do, do you know? There's yeah. A, so I think, you know, given your mum's age, she would have still been, you know, in that more modesty thing. I think mm. we're kind of changing a bit where we're trying to boost you know, yes. people's sense of self and, and believe in yourself. And even if you do that, I tried really hard with my kids. They still have, yeah. you know, those kind of issues that, that we all have. But yeah. So, I mean, I don't know where it comes from, but it does seem to be very peculiarly Irish. You look at other cultures. Yeah, well, I think... Big sense of self and how brilliant they are. And Their um, thing would be humility. That that's no one likes to show off. That's kind right. of the vibe of Ireland, really. Not maybe not anymore, but it certainly was. And as well, there's no when if I think about it now, like I was a very I was it was looking back, um, it was clear that I was a uh, show pony. Yeah, <laughs> like it you just was. Perform. Yeah, I did. Um, I don't know where it came from. I arrived with it because I'm adopted, which was also interesting because as a child I was fascinated with things that I could do that my family couldn't do and things that my family could do that I couldn't do. So, for example, my dad was um, amazing at maths. 
just a really mathematical mind like just numbers were so easy to him and I was the polar opposite like I struggle I still struggle with numbers I've no interest my, my brain just switches off I was much more languagey focused um I was a good writer as a child I remember you know kind of being stood up to read my stories out in primary school and I remember in my mind going why how come I can do that and why is that a str- that was like a strength and I was like where did it come from as an adopted child you can imagine all and you sorts. knew all along you were adopted yeah 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 yeah. yeah so yeah. you're you're you were trying to figure out your own who what, am I what yeah so every <laughs> child is trying to figure out who they are and yeah. I had no but blueprint. you had that you had the you had the extra of that because it's funny thing is and, and this is going to sound really really weird but a lot of children who grow up with their own parents who feel um, are going through that who am I and maybe don't like what they see around them and what they came from are kind of going God I hope maybe I was adopted I know do you know which know. is like so crazy I know, isn't gaff, it yeah. you know and whereas the adopted one is then going well who am I but there is something about being kind of spa- you're like spat out of a spaceship rather than you've no context for yourself you can't look back and be like oh yeah so that's my father that's my birth mother and that's why I have that head and that nose and la 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 and that's why I can do that and I can't do that and you're right maybe you have skills and abilities that no one else in your family does have but as an adopted kid you can't figure that out so there was a lot that was kind of the struggle growing up who am I and did you wonder um, did you wonder, because it wasn't until much later that, because you, you did get to meet your birth mother and, yeah. your, and your birth father, but that was much later. Mm. Did you wonder up to that point when you're a kid and you're trying to figure out who you are, whether there was something bad in, in your parents or were, did you imagine, did you, did you fantasize them and, and, you know, imagine them as these wonderful, amazing parents? Actors, actors, performers. Right. Also, I, I knew, I knew that I, like and I mean as a child being a great I, I was you know was given the good parts in the plays and the main reason was I could project my voice when you're young that's your they're like Jesus she's a great voice she doesn't even need a microphone that was my skill I was very confident on stage yeah. um, and very loud so I got all the good parts and I was like how come I can do this where did that come from so I fantasized in my brain that I was from this Di- acting dynasty maybe it was panto maybe it was twink yeah. maybe it was i remember uh, w- you come with these documents when you're adopted that give you a physical description of your birth parents and their hobbies and stuff and uh, my birth dad kevin is his name was i oh, i had so much hair i still have so much hair like i have to shave every three minutes but i've had laser now uh, but i'd like so just <laughs> hair the hair was always a huge thing and right. that came from him it was it was described in that little document thing. What that he's They're hairy. kind of instructions that you get. They're like feed the baby this at this time and this and, is what and she looks her like. dad is hairy. Ha- yeah, loads of hair. It was described <laughs> as he had a big head of hair because my birth mother was the one giving them the information and I don't want to talk about her too much because she's not that uh, cool with it. But so it was like all the hair. So I found and he was really tall and I was really tall. And um, so I was like, I remember this whiskey ad. Um, I could sing weirdly. It, that went i don't know that was probably you the can't bag. sing anymore no i don't really sing now <laughs> um but i was this little performing yeah. child and so i was like that's obviously come from somewhere so there was this whiskey ad on the telly and it was a, a man with loads of hair playing the bear on and i latched onto that and i was like that's my birth father so then i found them and i was like where's this showbiz dynasty and they were like what yeah he's an electrician she works in a chemist yeah no, yeah. no background. Nothing. See, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I it, it, it's kind of funny because I, I, I mean, for very different reasons, would have been um, uh, very unsure of who I was growing up, mm. and it's not just me. You know, siblings have gone into therapy, like you know who you are, and that was around how we were brought up. It was very much, yeah, we we were meant to be who you wanted us to be, and that makes it very hard to figure out who you are and dare you stray from it. Then you know. yeah, so there's a lot of families like that. Um, but uh, but I was a performer too, you know, yeah. and if I wasn't, so for me it was acting, excuse me, and there's no history of that in my family, but I think for me that was my therapy, that was how I could get to try out different people and try yeah. things on, different things, and I've never, I've done theatre and I'm actually classically trained in, in, in theatre, but but I never had a desire to be on stage in theatre, mm. because for me it wasn't about the 
the audience for me it was like you know figuring out and that's actually why I switched from acting to become uh, in later life to become a psychologist people said to me you know what why why are you you know moving from that to that there's a big jump no it's not a big jump I just want to understand human behavior yeah I want to understand what makes me tick why I not just me but everybody yeah why we do what we do and that was the same reason I was an actor and I loved being an actor um, and I still would love it you know but um uh, it's about for me the acting the buzz was figuring out why that person would say that and yeah. what they're saying and what they're thinking when they're not saying the words and I think that was kind of part of kind of a figuring sort of figuring yourself out yeah but I do have to say with age that you do start to get more comfortable in your own skin. I don't know if I see. I don't think that there's any set who you are. No, I think we're different in different contexts. I agree. I remember I read this book recently called "It Was a Game Theory." Basically, how in certain situations, like the, the, we have three stages of ourselves: the parent, the child. What was the other one? I don't know. There was parent, child. What would be a third stage? And in different situations... Isn't that funny? You've just linked it to parent and child. I know. Me, me, the individual. Yeah, but in certain certain situations, I'll react like a child. Like, say, you know, whether it be over some boyfriend issue or something, and I'll, I'll act like a child. Then in other situations, I'm an absolute parent. Yes. Do you know what I mean? And like different situations will trigger different reactions in you and um I find that book fascinating. I also find it really helpful. Oh right, okay, that's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. Not as helpful as your book. So something that really jumped out at me again, I, I felt like I was stalking you, you know, when you're kind of um kind of reading, but it, it 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 is interesting. I found you to be extremely um I really found your your you know, for somebody who's up on stage, what I loved the virtue, if it's called a virtue or whatever, the thing I value most in people is honesty. Mm. It matters to me over all things. Tell me the feckin' truth. I might hate it for a minute, but don't lie to me. Don't tell me that's great or, you know, you like this or you don't like that because that's really been mean to me. You yeah. know, just be honest and I value it. And if anyone ever asks my opinion, I will give an honest one. So the thing that really jumped out at me about, you know, you know, reading stuff on your website, listening to interviews, listening to other things you've you, you've done and snippets and things that you've, you you wrote from magazines was just the straight up honesty. I just loved it. It was just very raw and very human. And while sometimes when you're being interviewed, you can see the show face. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You can see that show face. We all kind of have a show face. And you have conscious. to have a show face. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you know, but it it was all it's all coming for a, from a very real honest place and i kind of i i really like that and 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 again for the same reason cuz i'm interested in how people tick you know what what makes them work and i'm kind of int- I, I sometimes think humans are a bit like puzzles mm. and i can't help myself but i want to try and solve it you know and you can't sometimes you can't but i still can't help that trying to figure and um and relating that to that you know yeah. um and and one thing that jumped out at me you talked about your childhood and uh, you know how maybe you're rejecting adulthood and you know um how you're you're a big child at heart and how that might have related to your your um uh your eating disorder um what jumped out at me was that you said and, and do you mind if i quote i can't no, remember go what this is from but um you might remember where it's from um there was something about comedy that really felt fulfilling to me right from the start, though. I don't really believe in fate, but I think that if I'd had to keep keep on doing PR, PR, I probably wouldn't have recovered. I started getting some momentum and then I got signed in the UK and things went from there. But for me, that big sentence there is it, you felt fulfilled. Yeah. And in a way, the question I want to ask is. So you were trying to find who you are and what I see as fulfilling when you're doing comedy that that you are so in the flow you lose yourself and mm. you're not thinking about who you are and to me that's how you find yourself and and for me what i think from that statement is in comedy you found yourself even though it's yeah. because you lose yourself does i fi- like i when i'm on stage like i just i just love it like i feel like that's my probably truest Self. And it's not because it's a hammed up version of me, of course, but I just adore it. And like, I was so lost. And I think that's why I got so ill. I just, I just wasn't doing what I should have been doing. Um, And I feel like growing up 
acting performing wasn't considered a real job it was considered a hobby and that you had to get a real job and that that's why it was all part of why I got so sick I think that I just had no sense of purpose I didn't I got no um satisfaction out of my work really uh, and it all felt wrong everything just felt wrong 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 and then when I started doing stand-up and when I started going on stage I started acting in a, in a play that's how I ended up in stand-up um everything felt it felt right everything just fell into place and clicked and had I had to recover without comedy being the prize then I wouldn't have I don't think I would have done it because being thin would have been more fulfilling than going back to because you had control uh, my over job. you were you you were in a in a job that you had no control and I mean the thing is when it comes to eating disorders as well like some of the neuroscience is around that it's linked to reward and and punishment mm. you know and and that not quite operating and in the achievement way. I felt like and I was achieving something I think that's what I was missing in my in job your, as well in your, in your yeah in that your I job was, I was achieving something by losing weight like every day you could wake up and you were a winner again because you, you dropped another pound yeah exactly you had purpose and yeah. there was a goal you were setting a goal and I mean yeah. I firmly believe it and, and that that's kind of why I'm not a fan of retirement is is that everybody has to have goals Everybody yeah. has to have purpose. You have to matter. Otherwise, like, what is the point? You yeah. have to be achieving something. So for me, I went into, um, and just I see so many parallels that I wasn't expecting to see, which is really, really funny because I couldn't be further from, you know, being a, <laughs> a, a comedian. But but I really do see some of the parallels in that I can still remember clearly the day the drama teacher came into our primary school and told us what drama classes were about I was eight yeah and I ran home and I begged my mother you know can I please do this this is what I want to do I felt just loved it I happened to be good at it and blah blah, blah. kind of went on from there but then when I became that that grown up and I, I mean I did my leaving at 16 so I wasn't really that grown up yeah but my father now was 42 when I was born so he was quite well on like you know even at that stage um I couldn't have said out loud that I wanted to be an actor. In fact, mm. I didn't think ordinary people became actors, you know, and that's way back before we had the internet. But it's all, that's what I dreamt about at night was, yeah. you know, being in the movies when I watched, you know, Little House on the Prairie, I was playing the part, you know, that's just who and what I wanted to be. But I daren't say it out loud. I mean, as far as my father was concerned and of his generation, and don't get me wrong, he was a wonderful man and really, really nice, but his generation believed that acting was the next profession to prostitution yeah, you know of because of the history etc with it so I couldn't say it out loud that I want to be an actor and I think a lot of us want to just please our dads yeah so I went to work in um the fifth child all he wanted his ambition for his children was for um them to work in the life the life insurance company that he'd worked in all his life yeah so um I did that and I did that for 15 years and um I got married and now one thing, I got my mortgage out of it, which was great, great. mortgage at 24. Um, and I followed that trajectory. And I'll be perfectly honest, like I just followed the, you get a job, you get a husband, you have kids, do you know? Mm. And I was, I was conscious that I should have kids uh, very early because I had older siblings and they hadn't got kids and, you know, that you know, things don't necessarily work out. So that's about as far as I thought in detail about having kids was, oh, I better have them yeah. in case I can't have them. Yes, yeah. Uh, but there was no, you know, big decision. So like I was pregnant the first year I got married and, you know, got on, you know, had another two after. And it was only then at that point when I had two little boys, little toddlers, and I was in this job that I hated and was totally unfulfilled. And, you know, you work to save money to go on holidays or to go out you know and forget about it but mm. once you have kids you didn't have money to do that so you an awful lot of time to think and I said I don't want them ending up in a job like I am I want a better future for them and I'm going to raise my kids to find what they love and find a way to get paid to, to do, do it, that yeah um, great theory yeah not everyone can do it though no but I realized though kids learn by example yeah and I said how how am I go so I jacked in my job um, and I had finished my teacher's diploma and set up a little drama school and then I became an actor and I yeah. worked as an actor for um, for 10 years and, and did, you know, did quite well at it and, uh, and it kind of worked out. But it's that thing that you're saying there that like for 15 years, I didn't do what I loved. And there was no way, like my mother would even say to me, oh, would you not go into, um, would you not go into Talk of the Towns or would you not go into amateur drama? And I'm kind of going, 
no I want to be a professional yeah. and I'm not doing that amateur stuff like it's either all or nothing mm. um, and it kind of is interesting because it just when you've kind of got a passion like that it just halts everything some people are so like they knew themselves I feel like they knew themselves so well so young like I remember this girl in school knew that was her name and she when we were 17 doing our leaving search and she was like I want to be a radiologist and I was like what? I thought it was like a pirate radio station. I was like, what? Because <laughs> I want to be a radiologist. And she became a radiologist and she is still a radiologist. Right. Like, I am still kind of thinking, listen, if this comedy thing doesn't work out, I'll go back, I'll do this, that and the other. Like, to be so self-assured yeah. at that age, I was so envious of it. I remember another girl, another friend of mine, Audrey, um, she's a dentist and she actually wanted to be a beautician, but she comes from a long line of dentists and her parents were very uh, definite that she was going to be a dentist. And I remember being really envious of that because my family was like, they were more so, and she was, my mum was, was trying to give me free freedom um but you know i knew that i wasn't really allowed to the acting thing but she was open to other things but um i had no i felt like i had no real direction i wanted to be told what, what to, to do. do i yeah. wanted to be told if what you couldn't to do. do what you wanted to do i wanted to be told what to do you have validated. to do this you need to go do be a lot be a solicitor do medicine whatever like this is what you i was just dying for someone to tell me what i should do uh, do you think I just flailed around how, then. How are you on decisions? Because I remember Terrible. Thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm really suggestible. Like, I can't be left on my own with the laptop for too long or I'll start believing the earth is flat. Like, I'm very really? suggestible. Yeah. I make no decisions on my own. Like, I just... Um, I ended up doing arts in UCD. I did English and sociology. And I loved sociology. I wanted to be a writer. Great, they're both great subjects for comedy. Yeah, they're brilliant. I yeah. love sociology. Oh my God, I loved it so much. And I mean, it took me seven years to do my degree because I was such, that I is was one fanning around I so much. To ask. It was just... Sure, I didn't know what I... I, was, I just was like, what am I, why am I here? I don't get right. it. I don't get, I don't get it. But then I, everyone thought that I was um, thick, which I was really <laughs> concerned me then <laughs> because I knew I wasn't thick. So I went back and I studied really hard in my final year and then I came first in my degree uh, first in my year in, in sociology so because of that you get offered this like doctorate you can skip the masters you get a oh, you get really? a scholarship whatever to do a doctorate and I was like yeah I'll do that and then my friend Owen was like I don't think you'd like it you'd be on your own all the time um I don't think academia would suit you and I was like okay <laughs> so I just didn't do it right and I, end, and I ended up in a job where I'm on my own all the time anyway but everything worked out but my point is that I allow we still joke about it but like I allowed Anya to make that massive decision for me because I don't trust my own instincts I never have even on stage I have to remind myself no 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 don't do what you think Other Kevin Bridges like, would do do, yeah, what do what you would do yeah yeah because then you've what nobody do you else do? to blame but yeah. yourself and you, you, you're learning from it what do you really think about this Joanne what is your real opinion on this not what do you think is the popular or the trendy opinion what is your actual and opinion and I think that's really hard to do and I think it's a yeah because really, it turns out you're a really fascist good... <laughs> no I'm kidding I'm no, not a fascist no no but I actually <laughs> think it brings us really nicely to that bit kind of where we're, where we're talking about um, tips for for people yes uh, and I actually think that's because uh, I just think that's so true. I, you know, in in life, when when I've made stupid decisions, actually, if I think back at them, they weren't really my decisions. Yeah. I let other people sway me. So will we start you off with we with you know one of your one that uh, that almost. I think that's a brilliant tip to yeah. to to listen to your instinct your gut like I've d ignored my instinct on several like I mean all the time and but I, even the way the way they use it like an instinct like it's not real in that book that I was talking about um earlier they talk about like the communication side of a woman's ba brain being like three times the size of a man's and that no is that not true that the communication side is larger so I was it lied to <laughs> by a scientist <laughs> Men and, they, men and women's brains aren't all that different. I mean, no, really but there is there is a difference in the size of the communication part. That's why men are so bad at it. And I know that's a generalization, but like, honestly, like my ex boyfriend would he'd rather have thrown himself off a pier than discussed how he felt about anything. It was so frustrating. Whereas all I wanted to do was talk about my feelings. He's like, oh my god, are you having another feeling? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm having a feeling. I think we should talk about it all. Let's unpack my feeling. Um. One thing I would say to you though is, so everybody's brain is different. Broadly speaking, they're in different places. But you see, your brain, bits of your brain can get bigger and smaller depending on you know whether yeah. you're actively using them or whatever. But um, one thing actually, what you're referring to as instinct, 
I wouldn't refer to as instinct. So our instinctive behaviors tend to be things like, you know, running in the face of, you know, fear or the instinctive response, you know, to a threat. Yeah. I would actually call that listening to your brain, listening to your past experiences, actually letting your brain do a lot of the work for you because basically it has all the information yeah and if you've set that problem to it it can actually go back all the previous no actually that worked in that situation it's not there's not a voice in your head if you know what i mean but your brain can make those connections Mm. and then come out with actually this is a good idea now that's happening unconsciously to you but it's based on it's an informed idea because it's based on you know previous things that worked out for you or didn't work out for you or what you're good at and what will work. Yeah. Much more so than somebody coming over and saying, oh, I don't think you'd like that. How the hell do they know whether you'd like that or not? Because they're not living inside you. And what gives you reward is is what key. So I would actually say, instead of saying, and this is terrible, I just asked you for a tip and now I'm I'm saying to you, don't say trust your instinct. That's not going to work. Trust your brain. No, because that's what it is. And actually, to be honest, I think you're, undervaluing yourself by saying trust your instinct because we all have almost identical instincts yeah. in that instinctive behavior means you know that um whereas actually really what you're 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 talking about is trust the richness of my experience trust all the things i've learned all the things that i'm good you know i'm val valuable i have valuable information yeah i'm valid to make that decision i think i'm very good at reading people Mm -hmm. That is something I am good at. I think I have a fairly high emotional intelligence, Mm -hmm. um, which is which is helpful in my line of work. And that's something. So before in relationships or with friendships and stuff, and I would ignore that. I would because, you know, this kind of confirmation bias. You want to believe what you want to believe. So you ignore your brain Mm -hmm. and if this man is saying that that woman is just his friend from the gym even though you're pretty sure they're riding (laughs) you just go along with it because you want him to be telling you the truth so as I get older I I do trust Trust, my brain more yeah yeah I I think but when I when they call it female intuition I feel like that makes it sound like some sort of wizardry or something whereas it's not it's like exactly they're real thoughts you are really processing and taking in information taking in information and and, reading things yeah and I mean that's why so it's like you said earlier you know uh for smoking it was because you can see your face and you wanted to stop I stopped smoking for the same reason Mm. it wasn't all the death messages on the on the packet because we feel immortal you know we just do you just don't make the connection you don't you don't think it'll ever happen to you Uh, and you said because you can't see your heart or your liver but the thing is like people don't even think about their brain Mm. do you know like it it doesn't even come into the equation at all and it's like that's why this podcast is called super brain it is the most amazing um structure like it's the most complex structure in the universe and and, and we're just not we don't value it or use it or you always read those stories about like someone gets a knock on the head and they wake up and they can speak fluent mandarin now obviously i just made that up but you know what i mean (laughs) i do know what you mean you've the you've the you've the opportunity for or the potential for so much in there and whatever way mine is wired now if i got a knock i could be a different person well, it depends. It would depend where you got the knock. But yeah. actually, if you got the knock in, in your towards your frontal lobes, an awful lot of people will say they've had a complete personality change. Now, the reason for that is your frontal lobes are bidirectionally connected to all the other areas of your brain. So it works both ways. So they are involved in like inhibiting behavior. Mm. So they're the thing that says when you walk into the room in front of your mat, like you said to me, can I curse? Um, that actually it's your frontal lobes that, that made you ask that yeah is this live can i say it can i can i curse whatever so if that's damaged you actually can't access your previous behaviors all the learned behaviors and it's a lot of the learned behaviors is what makes you because yeah. you have patterns of behavior you behave this way when you're on stage you behave this way with your friends this way with your mom when that's damaged you don't have access to that if your brain is working in one way it's habitual you can change that if it's something you don't want that's what i really like it's that the you know there would be some people would think that your personality is your personality it's very much set in stone and like I don't think that I think I'm a completely different person to the person I was probably even five years ago but some things have remained um like I'm much more organized now because I've had to become organized whereas I just accepted myself as a chaotic person because I was 
I didn't have a reason to not be chaotic. Now I have to be organized. You I cannot miss another brain flight. You to be organized. Yeah. And you know that, yeah, because you lose a gig. I yeah. was on a plane the other day to Iceland and felt so sorry. There was a Just Mustard, you know, the band Just Mustard, an no. Irish band. And Ham Sandwich. <laughs> It's a ham sandwich. <laughs> Sounds a bit like it, doesn't it? <laughs> I really hope you made that mistake because that is hilarious. No, it's just mustard. Oh, because there's a band called Ham Sam. No, and well, they should get together. <laughs> Shut up. That's gas. <laughs> They're called Just Mustard. But we're sitting on this flight. I was going to, to Iceland with my friends for fun and, and we were in the front row. Like we had front row seats as they, at this hor- horrendous drama that was unfolding. All the band, they'd got this super gig. You know what it's like? Yeah. In, us, uh, um, in Iceland and then a whole TV thing. And they're waiting for their their bass player to arrive, and they're asking them not to close the door, and they're not, and and they kept giving him another few minutes, and then we were saying, give them another few minutes, you know, and and he never made it on the plane, and we were then talking to the guy who was sitting beside us, and I just said, you, you know, my friend said to him, um, has this happened before? And he said, no, it's not the first time. And she said, well, you know, maybe you need to get another bass player, and we may have to change the name of the band, but <laughs> he said, um, oh, but he's such a brilliant bass player and I says well you've no fucking bass player now yeah I know you know as brilliant as he is you're not getting to do this gig and I hate to tell you this past behavior predicts future past behavior predicts future behavior unless you actively work to change that behavior yeah and And that's why people get so much out of therapy and stuff because and and and, um uh cognitive behavioral um cbt and all that stuff because you like that was like what the way I had to remap the way I thought about food I had to completely overhaul my relationship with food and it took years and it was so slow and so difficult but I was like I, d- I have no other choice here I have to do this and um, so I agree with you when people have like kind of antisocial parts to their personality or whatever or like that like unreliable or unprofessional they have to make a concerted effort to change it I had to make a concerted effort to be more organized and I think in a way his band members were facilitating it by yeah, he should saying, be fired. Oh, it's okay. They, well, you know, even well, now everybody makes a mistake, and we can all be late. But saying, look, you know, unless you're, yeah. you're out. So, just kind of winding up now. If if you were, because I'm sure there could be people listening who may be struggling with um, eating disorders and you know issues. Is there any kind of advice, or would you prefer not to give advice, or anything that you could say from your experience? That well, I would say f- was when I was unwell. Uh, <laughs> I would say start the work now because it's it does take time. What I would say is it's I I'm so much happier. Oh, that's wonderful. Without it, and I never saw that as an option. I just assumed that I'd be forced to get better, and that it would just mean I was always unhappy with my body, that I would just hate myself forever, and I would always consider myself fat and everything. And when you actually work through that, it's so much nicer. You're just free. You can just live your life. You're not like this like shadow over you all the time or like you're kind of under someone's thumb the whole time um that you're at, you'll actually be much happier out of it that's a lovely part and i think that's a that's a hard thing to remember when you're in it because you do feel like you're kind of sacrificing something by getting better and actually you you're feel, not did you feel did you think you were happy when you were unwell yeah, I thought I was. You thought you were happy. Yeah, and it was. Really I, interesting. It spiraled then eventually, and when I eventually went into treatment, because it, it was like I kind of hit a rock bottom moment of saying like I can't actually live like this anymore. It, this is no and, longer and worth. You can't live. Yeah, because exactly. That's the thing. It is. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's huge horrific. fatality yeah. rates. But I was like, I can't live like this anymore. So, I, I in the first kind of the it was all in stages the first bit was like right i need to figure out how to maintain this weight at a in a healthier way which of course was absolute madness because i was incredibly underweight but I, it took me a while to let go of the anorexic thinking that like i really struggled with that and, and putting on weight was hard and i'd feel like i'd bloomed and i'd actually put on like a pound or all that um but you have to kind of fight back and you have to choose it every day like i still have to choose it every day yes. I still have to choose if I put on, put on weight. Like, I'm half a stone up at what I would usually be at the moment. And I'm going to Thailand soon. Um, and I'm like, oh. And then I'm like, no. You look fabulous. Thank you. You I'm do like, look it's fabulous. absolutely grand. It doesn't matter. You've, you've a lovely life. You're free to do this. You're free to do that. You're not your body. You've more to offer the world. Like, it's still, you know, 
you and, need and to choose it every day is what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, and you may have a you know a, you know a, an underlying predisposition to think a certain mm. way, but that that's the you know all of us have predispositions for certain things. Like some people are predispositioned to become alcoholics or yeah. whatever. It doesn't mean that it's predestined or predetermined. It means that you actually have to just work a bit harder than other yeah. people to override what may be the first response and then oh, other days oh, yeah that. and other days i get an absolute kick out of being recovered and i get an absolute kick out of look at me eating a sandwich look at this <laughs> look at me living my life eating a sandwich like I, I get a kick out of it i enjoy it and that's never something i thought that i would say or th- or think yeah um yeah it's better on this side of it much better thank you so much to joanne for being great crack and superbly honest i love her super brain If you're struggling with an eating disorder, I hope that Joanne's sage advice to start the work sooner rather than later helps. And while it's not easy, I hope you find comfort in knowing that life is better on the right side of recovery. Much better. Joanne is currently bringing her brilliant brand of comedy to venues throughout the UK and Ireland. Check out her website, joannemcnally.com, to find a show near you. Thank you to Collaborative Studios. For regular updates and bonus material, follow Superbrain Podcast on Instagram and at Sabina underscore Brennan on Twitter. Subscribe to Superbrain on Apple, Spotify, Google, Acast or wherever you consume your podcasts. And remember, if you love it, rate it, review it and share it. My name is Sabina Brennan and you've been listening to Superbrain, the podcast for everyone with a brain.